Hey guys, it is Patrick and welcome to this lesson. Uh, this is the first lesson in this tax course and so hopefully you enjoy um, how this is structured and you enjoy some of the uh, material that you're going to be learning here in this class. Now specifically in this lesson, we are talking about the history of taxes and we're also gonna give you kind of an understanding of what has gone on and what is going on with our tax law. So starting off with an introduction with tax history history. So why are we talking about taxes? Why are you taking a course in tax? Why do we need to do any of this? Let's talk a little bit of history behind that. So the why. Well, the why is because of the 16th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution signed in 1913. That amendment basically said that Congress is allowed to collect taxes on all of its citizens here in the United States. Now, really, it didn't start just in 1913 with the 16th Amendment. We had a civil war to pay for. And in 1861, Congress established the first income tax here in the United States to pay for the war. And because of that, that's kind of where taxes came about. Um, when the war was finished and Congress didn't need the money any longer, they repealed the tax law. And then in 1913 made it permanent with the addition of the 16th Amendment. And so we go on to understand here what the 16th Amendment says. Well, here we have it right in front of us. It says that Congress should have the power to lay and collect taxes on income from whatever source is derived without apportionment among the several states and without regard to any census or enumination. So there is a lot of stuff here. Let me break this down for us. Uh, so Congress shall have the power to lay and collect taxes on income. So this word here, power um, to collect, taxes on income basically says that Congress can collect taxes on income. And obviously Congress has used that power because we are paying taxes on our income. Now, the next three words here are very important in tax law. And it says from whatever source derived. And that is a contentious three words here because it basically means worldwide income income. So if you are a U.S. citizen and you're working abroad and you don't set foot in the United States for a full year, full calendar year, which means you're not using really any of the benefits of the United States, because you're a U.S. citizen, they are allowed to tax you on your income from that foreign country. So worldwide income. In other countries, they don't have this worldwide income situation. Uh, a lot of times these other countries only tax their citizens on how much they make in their country. And so we kind of have an imbalance here when it comes to U.S. tax law and the rest of the world. Now, uh, another key thing here in just this sentence, so there's a lot in this sentence, without apportionment among the several states and without regards to any census or enumeration. The key word here is without apportionment. And what this is basically saying is that they don't need to collect taxes based on the number of citizens or based on land masses of its state. And this is important because it also means that they don't have to collect just 1%, let's say, in Montana versus 10% in California because Montana has um, less population than California. It says that Congress pretty much can make their own rules and collect whatever they want. So apportionment is an important thing because what the idea is that if we did have apportionment, we would find a way to figure out how much each state should pay of the 100% pie. So if we said it's based on population, California would, California California citizens would pay more than, let's say, Montana's, um, and then Texas would pay more than, let's say, Oklahoma, because Texas population is bigger than Oklahoma. So those key words there basically says that because um, without apportionment, they don't need to apportion based on population or land or any type of other way of doing it. Okay. So again, very important part here, 16th amendment, even that just sentence there 
gives a lot of good information of what Congress can do and how taxes are taxed on our income. Now, well, along with the 16th Amendment that made way for something called the Internal Revenue Code, the Internal Revenue Code is basically the law to which we have to follow when it comes to income taxes. So this is one of many tax authorities that you're going to hear about in this class. Uh, but specifically, the big one is the Internal Revenue Code or the IRC. So oftentimes, if you're asked, can you check uh, the Internal Revenue Code or the tax law or the IRC, it's all meaning the same thing. So that's the official rule book when it comes to tax law. Now, what's in that rule book? Well, basically, it sets the standards for how we tax individuals, corporations, partnerships, as well as other tax rules. Other tax rules um, could be excise taxes. It could be taxes on imports and exports of goods. And so basically what we're saying here is that the Internal Revenue Code is the tax law that we must follow from a tax perspective. So if you want any reference, that's where you're going to. Now, before we end this lesson, let's talk a little bit about the changes uh, to the tax law in 2017 because of the passage of the tax Cut and Jobs Act. Specifically, I want to mention the tax forms because in this course, we're going to spend a lot of time helping you understand how to actually prepare a tax return. And by the end of this section, you should know how to prepare a basic tax return on a 1040. But before we do that, we want to explain to you what forms you're going to be using and what forms we have been using in the past. So prior to the passage of the Tax Cut and Jobs Act in 2017, we had three tax returns. And the three tax returns that we have were the Long Form 1040, the 1040A, and the 1040 easy or the short form. Now, basically, it depended on how complex your taxes were. If they weren't that complex, you would use the 1040 easy simple form. If it was a little bit more complex, but not to the efficiency where you're doing itemized deductions on your tax return, and if you don't know what that is, we'll get to that um, soon, then you could use the 1040A, and then we have the 1040 or the long form. Uh, some people would say that the 1040 is the expandable for. You use the 1040 as a template and then you add all of these schedules behind it. Now talking about schedules here, we also have schedules A through F. Those are the most common schedules. And so if you were preparing a 1040, you may have to add these schedules behind it to uh, give more information about your income or your deductions or your expenses. Now there's more than just A through F, uh, but those are the most basic ones. There's R, there's EIC, and we'll get to most of them in this course. Now what was the change? Well, the change happened for tax year beginning on 2018 and on. So um, in 2019 will be the first time we're actually using this. So we always prepare taxes the following year when the tax year ends. So you see up here I have 2017 tax year, filed in 2018. Um, so uh, we wait for the 2017 tax year to happen and then we file our taxes based on the 2017 and 2018. So sometimes a lot of people get confused when it comes to these tax years. So 2017 tax year would be 2017, but we don't file that into 2018. So let's talk about 2018 and beyond. So for tw tax year 2018 and beyond, or filing season 2019 and beyond, we've reduced all three of those main forms into just the form 1040. Now we have one form, some people would call it the postcard form. Basically it's a two page form folded in half, so it's a back and front, kind of like a postcard. And so we have the 1040, but there was a lot of good, useful tools on the 1040 long form in 2017. So that old form was very useful and it was very helpful. The problem was in order to get it to postcard size, we had to eliminate a whole bunch of lines that were useful on the 1040, the old 1040 form. And so in order to accommodate that, uh, the IRS basically figured out a way to do this small little 1040 form, but then add a whole bunch of schedules to it. 
and these new schedules are schedules one through six. So these schedules one through six don't necessarily, um, they're not new per se, they just replace the lines that were uh, removed from the old 1040 form and put on these new schedules. So we still have schedules A through F, so not only did we make our forms more complicated, now we have more of them. But for the mass majority of tax payers, the 1040 could be the only form that they need to fill out. And as you will see, schedules one and six will be important for some taxpayers. So even though we've condensed the tax return into a one postcard type of size, um, you're gonna find that there will be a lot of taxpayers who will also need to file a different schedule with their 1040. And you're gonna see that in this section. So. We added the schedules one through six, and we have the 1040 form, and then we still have the schedules A through F. So I don't know if it made it any simpler, uh, but that's kind of where we are with the tax forms. And in this course, we're gonna spend a lot of time helping you understand how to fill out the basic 1040, and then the schedules one through six, and A through F. But it's important to tell you that now because you might have conversations with tax preparers right now who might reference, reference 1040EZ or 1040A, those are tax returns that we no longer use for tax year 2018 and beyond. We'll still have form 1040A and 1040EZ because you may have taxpayers who still have not filed their 2017 return, 2015 return, 2014 return, probably their 1995 return. If that is the case, they can go back and use these old forms because those were the forms that were available at that time. And again, last note here, there are more than just schedules A through F but generally speaking, A through F series is the bulk of them, but we also have H, J, S, E, R, E, I, C, and many more from that. So um, don't be swayed if this is just the tax forms. There are t literally hundreds of forms that you could fill out or need to fill out for your client. So. This lesson really gave you just a snippet history of the tax law. Really, it's giving you that base foundation of why we need ta why we need the tax profession for in the first place due to the 16th Amendment, and then give you a little bit of color to the new tax forms that we will be using in this course um, because of the passage of the Tax Cut and Jobs act. So as we go through these lessons here in this first chapter, um, we're trying to lay that foundation to help you understand how tax law works. And then by the end of this chapter, our goal is to get you to be able to fill out a basic 1040 form. So with that, hope you enjoy that and we'll see you in the next video.